Jay Neal here yet? CJCC Director Jay Neal. Jay, thank you so much for being here for all that you do. State Senator Caker, Patrick, uh, State Rep Sheila Clark Nelson, Mark Newton, and Jody Lott. Y'all are here as well, so if y'all would mind raising your hands, stand up. Okay, is Kay here yet? No, not here yet, she's gonna be here. Uh, Chief Judge McKay from the Workers' Comp Board. Chief, Chief Judge McKay is going to speak in a little bit. Uh, uh, Commissioner Ellis from Fulton County, who's been a part of all that we've been doing. I don't know if Bob is here yet as well. Uh, Augusta Coroner Mark Bowen and Augusta Fire Chief uh, Christopher James. Are y'all here as well? Thank y'all very much for, for all that y'all do as well. So I also want to thank the media that's here today. You know, this, getting the word out about this crisis is critical. So let me just talk a little bit about why we're doing this task force and why we're doing it the way that we are doing it. You know, when I took, uh, I was appointed to this position in November of 2016 and uh, knew that this was a national epidemic. Uh, and uh, it's, it's unfortunately a crisis that has not spared our state. Four Georgians die each and every day as a result of this crisis. And so as we went around the state, it is a crisis, it's, it's an issue that we deal with in four corners of the state of Georgia. It doesn't matter where we go. If I asked everybody in this room, if you knew somebody in your family or had a friend uh, that was impacted by opioid addiction, uh, that had suffered an overdose or a loss, that three quarters of the room would raise your hand. So as we went around, we saw that you know, there's a lot of passion in this state. There are a lot of assets and resources that we have to confront this crisis. But the one thing it seemed like we were lacking was communication. It seemed like we did have folks that were working on this. We had law enforcement, and we had the university system, and we had nonprofits, uh, the CDC. We had a lot that was going on, but we weren't communicating. So we decided to build on what we did at Economic Development, and that's do this task force a little differently. Let's build an infrastructure of communication amongst and between all of the folks that are passionate about this issue, that have expertise in this issue. You know, most times you do a task force, you kind of identify six or seven different folks, go around the state, take testimony, they write a white paper, nobody ever reads it, and that's the end of it. But this is open, this task force is open to all 10.4 million Georgians. If you have an interest or a passion or an expertise, we want everybody at the table. And so we, that's what we did. We decided to build it this way. So this is our third meeting. Our first meeting was in October in Atlanta. And we had 35 different groups present in two and a half hours. And the whole point was to get everybody in the room. And we wanted to ask three questions. What are we doing to address the crisis as a group or individual? Number two, how can we work together to leverage those assets, those resources, and that passion to address this crisis? And number three, if there is a gap, how are we going to fill that gap? Now, my preference isn't to create another government program is to leverage the experience that we have in this state. And this has been a successful endeavor so far because again, as I've just mentioned a few minutes ago to somebody outside, this is a crisis that cannot, must not, and should not fall on the shoulders of any one organization or group. It's too big. It impacts too many people. It impacts too, uh, every community in Georgia. So to have everybody at the table has been critically important. As a result of that first meeting, and we'll hear a, a, an update from our state partners, but the state is now focused on a statewide plan. The Department of Public Health, Department of Community Health, and Behavioral Health are all coming together to spearhead that from the state perspective. So we'll get an update on that in a little bit. Secondly, folks are saying, you know, there's no one repository for information about this crisis that we can actually use. So we created a dose of reality. Now, this wasn't our creation. We actually borrowed it from the Wisconsin Attorney General's office, Brad Schimmel, who's been a champion on this issue. But he said, look, y'all take whatever you need, turn it into said gave this to any state AG we said you know tailor it for your state so this is what we've been using and I would encourage anyone in this room everybody in this room please go to those reality ga.org at some point take a look tell us how we can improve upon it but it's broken down into different categories for parents for coaches for students for the medical profession we're going to add veterans and law enforcement but it's got information that can be used. In fact, our friends in the hospital association and, and in hospitals around the state said, look, this is some good information we can use uh, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the walls and on the halls of our, our hospitals. So it's been absolutely fantastic. The other thing we have is a uh, interactive map. You can type in your zip code and it will show all the disposal boxes that are around the state. And I want to thank the 
sheriffs and police chiefs and, and uh, pharmacies around the state that have located disposal boxes because unfortunately, this crisis will oftentimes start uh, right at home in your own medicine cabinet. So that came out of that as well. The second meeting happened in April and we focused on three areas. Newborns, because of neonatal abstinence syndrome, we have too many children in our state that are now being born addicted. It is absolutely <coughs> horrific to see it, to hear the cries of those children. And so we wanted to focus on that. Secondly, we've got more children going into the foster care system now with one or both parents who are addicted. And more and more often are they addicted to opioids. And then three, we wanted to focus on youth, particularly youth athletics. I love playing sports. Probably a lot of folks in this room love playing sports, but from time to time, you're gonna get an injury. And as I met a young man at the uh, at Kennesaw, they've got a great re uh, recovery center at Kennesaw, and I had a chance to meet with some students there. He was an athlete, played for lacrosse. He didn't actually get hurt, but his teammate did. And his teammate got 30 pills, never used one of them, but he did, and that's how his, his, it was his entrance to addiction. So we focused on that, and today we're here at Augusta. And we're focusing on, in the role of medical colleges, the medical profession, and getting outside the state, because it, outside of Metro Atlanta, because this isn't a Metro Atlanta crisis, this is a state of Georgia crisis. So I cannot thank y'all enough today. I'm, I will act as the MC for, for the remainder of today. But right now, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote, uh, Senator Johnny Isaacson. Now, Johnny makes it the point to say, do not give me a long introduction, and I am not going to cross my ex-boss. Okay. <laughs> so I want to say this. It is an honor to have worked for Johnny Isaacson. Anybody that knows Johnny, uh, he is the model public servant. I learned more about politics and public policy and business and just being a good human being from Johnny Isaacson. So to have him here today, and unfortunately, this crisis has impacted him personally. So I cannot thank him enough for taking the time to be here today. Let me introduce our Senator, uh, Johnny Isaacson. say that far too often, they hate to see me coming to Washington. I said, we cure addiction, the opioids are over. We've got to find a way to stop it. Because it's a terrible, terrible disease. A lot of people who smoke know what addiction to a, something like a cigarette can do. And it's tough. But you talk about some of these drugs and fentanyl and some of the stuff that's being added to those drugs and supplements today, it's a terrible thing. So I agreed to come today for three reasons. One is to tell you that I'm involved because I want you to be involved and we ought to be involved every day. What does that mean? It means we talk about it. We learn about it. We support people who are in the field of protecting it, or protecting our kids from it and our other children. <coughs> we do everything we can to make it public energy number one for all our community. Every one of us do that. That's important. Number two, I want to tell you a personal story. A lot of people say, well, that's never going to affect me. I'm sure glad none of my kids are on drugs. I'm sure I don't have a drug problem. I'll sure help them. I'll go to a couple meetings and I'll contribute $50 to the big fun we're going to have this Christmas and we'll help somebody who's got problems. But I'm glad I don't have to worry about it. Everybody in this room's got to worry about it. In 2016, at about 3 o'clock in the morning, a 
in my condominium in Washington. My telephone rang. I've had that happen once before in my life at three in the morning. I didn't like it then, I didn't like it this time. It was, it was the law enforcement officer in Bullock County who told me my grandson had been found dead in his apartment at Georgia Southern University. Two days before, he graduated summa cum laude in mathematics from Georgia Southern. Two days before. Why would somebody overdose themselves two days before? I unfortunately don't have that answer, but I know one part of that answer is if he had never been addicted in the first place, it wouldn't have happened in the second place. But he had been. Charlie was a great kid, but got his sophomore year in high school, he got involved with some things that he didn't know that much about. Looked the other way, didn't know what to look for in life. You know, when he got to be a freshman at the University of Georgia, we figured out what had happened. And he was rebelling against us for trying to get him to stop. We did everything we could to intercede with him to get him to stop. And there was a separation. Now, when I say we, I'm talking about his, my son and his wife and my wife and myself and our family members did everything we could. We couldn't do it. Finally, he ran away and left. He finally came back after living on the streets for a couple of weeks and said he really wanted to get help. And so we put him in a program. And thanks to Georgia Southern University and thanks to many of the organizations and groups in Georgia, he went into a program, a three-year program living and working the dream, the dream of not being addicted to drugs. He got his degree in mathematics from Georgia Southern, as I say, he graduated summa cum laude, would have graduated summa cum laude two days after he died. He got a job and did well. He met a young lady who also had been a drug addict, and they had become very close. I don't know if they would have ever gotten married, but they had that kind of relationship. Whatever the case may be, and whatever happened that night, none of us know, he ended up taking a drug that was far more potent than he realized what he was doing. Because a lot of things that they put in, some of these things they cut today to make them more powerful, will also kill you touch. So when you call me, this is where you come in, Vernon. I, I knew I could find out some information fast about my son that could have happened on the university property. And so I called the GBI, helped me, and I got the information quickly, and talked to the Bullock County Law Enforcement Authorities. And immediately we went to work to help do things we could do to help see that never happen again to anybody else. We established the fund at Georgia Southern we raise money for today for students who have been in trouble, to get them out of trouble. Everywhere I go, I talk to people that don't get yourself in trouble. So wherever, everywhere I go, I tell them trouble lies around every corner. And don't ever think it can't happen to you, because by God it can. And the only person that ultimately is responsible for letting it not happen to you is you. I want to help you and you'll want to help me, but let's all work together to see to it nobody dies or loses a grandchild, loses a child, loses a loved one because they took illegal drugs, got addicted to drugs, and drugs took over their life. Now the third reason that I came was to talk about some of the things that I, I believe are important for us to realize as public officials. And tell you what we're getting ready to do in Washington. You'll hear a lot of this the last three months of this year. The Health, Labor, Health Education, Labor, and Pension Committee, which I'm on, and the Senate Finance Committee, which I'm on, both are taking on the opioid crisis from two point standpoints. One is funding for programs, and I've already been thanked by a couple of people here that are getting some of the federal money we've targeted to come to local communities to fight the opioid problem. But also we're gonna change some policy. We're gonna incentivize the drug companies to develop drugs that are an alternative to opioids for pain, period. I hate to sound like I'm an expert in every element of pain, but I had a serious back problem three years ago. <clears throat> Two years ago, I had a major operation on my back, and they put me on oxycodone, hydrocodone. And after about two days of that stuff, I went out of the hospital. I was going crazy. I could already tell the effect of those opioid-based painkillers on me. And I went, I saw my doctor, and I said, I don't like the way I'm feeling. He said, we can try and manage it with a Tylenol. And I said, let's do that. A Tylenol won't kill me. He said, well, too much of it will kill you, too, as a matter of fact. But we'll let you take 3,000 milli 3, milligrams a day. So I took 3,000 milligrams a day of Tylenol for six weeks, was in the hospital for three of those weeks, got over the pain, got my back healed, and I walked with a cane, I have a few problems like that, but don't have near the problems I used to have. But you can't overcome it if you get the right people and tell them you don't want hydrocodone and oxycodone and the, the narcotic-based, opioid-based painkillers, because they may kill the pain, but they'll start a life of pain. So it's a temporary killing of pain for a permanent painful life, and that's something we don't want to have. So when you have a situation to go to a doctor and be treated for pain, make sure you know what you're getting. Make sure your kids or athletes are going to doctor know what they're getting. 
Make sure they understand what they're taking. It's never too much to just say, well, it's a doctor, I trust him. I can tell you as chairman of the Veterans Administration and, and the Veterans Committee in Washington, we got the CDC to issue for us a, a recommended prescription regimen for hydrocodone and oxycodone, which greatly has reduced the amount of prescriptions that can be made to veterans now in the Veterans Administration for pain and using hydrocodone and oxycodone. And it's, it's made a difference in the amount of it that's used. It was being handed out in Tacoma, Washington as a candy almost to manage pain. And because people were in their pain managed for a couple of weeks, they got their life going for a year, two or three or four or five. So know what you're putting into your system and limit what you're putting in your system. And I want to tell you, you know what the biggest source of opioids is for the kids and the addicts of America? The drugs that are in the medicine cabinet in your kid's bathroom. You don't think your kids, if they're looking for something, don't start in the, in the bathroom and medicine chest. You're crazy. You don't think there's not stuff in there that can be bad for them. You're crazy. And it's your responsibility to know what's in there and know that the medicine that you've got in your house is prescriptive in nature and may or may not be an opioid or some other narcotic substance. It's your job to find out if it is, and it's your job to put it somewhere where they can't get it. So save yourself that little bit of trouble, because that's where an awful lot of people today get a hold of the things and get them hooked to begin with. Their own parents' medicine chest, their own locker room painkiller at school or something like that. In the end, I'm just trying to make this point. One, it can happen to anybody at any time, even if they're a graduate summa cum laude in mathematics from Georgia Southern, that's number one. Number two, it doesn't matter who their parents are, whether they're a United States Senator, a wonderful life wife like my wife Diane, two great kids, my daughter-in-law daughter Susan, my son Kevin, and my son John. It can happen to anybody, and when it does, it's equally as devastating. And it's mostly all our fault. We don't make it aware enough to the community how dangerous it is. There are not enough, enough people just resting around thinking, well, it never happened to me. And they ought to be looking around to make sure they're doing things to prevent it ever happening to them. We all do that, and if we, if we accomplish that with all of us individually in this conference, then for the men and women in law enforcement that are in this room, the PMTs that are in this room, the people that answer a call for a drug addict who's, who's about to die, and they're trying to save him at the last minute with the last life-saving shot, we want to prevent those last life-saving life shots not, by not, not having to give them Let's be aware, let's be open, let's be tough, and let's know it could happen to any of us. And if we work hard and work together, there's no limit to what we can do. We live in the greatest country on the face of this earth. You find people trying to break out of the United States, they're all trying to break in. Because it's the greatest place in the world. But it's gracious that we make it that way and we did it with hard work and ingenuity. We can do the same thing with